Hello and welcome to my channel, Rage Against the Dark Arts. I am Miriam Francis and today I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey um, back in time as I do. And as you can see here next to me is the beginnings of my red yarn investigation. What I want to do is put together the um, some information about the OSA cases and the OSA operations. Of course, that includes Mike Rinder. So we've got a nice big photo of him at the top. Um, this is just the beginnings of it. So I just wanted to sort of like break it down one little piece at a time. And, you know, we're just going to start slow and simple. And eventually this whole cork board will be filled with um, lots of information, maybe some question marks, um, definitely lots of red yarn and lots more photos. So that's gonna be fun. I do wanna also print off a map and put that on there too. Um, there are a couple, there's at least three, there's three locations that we're going to focus on primarily through the course of this series. And that's going to be California, Florida, and Australia. And um, and so, yeah, I'll just sort of take you on a little bit of a story time each time and hopefully you'll, um, you'll stay tuned for those as I roll them out. So what I've got today is a video that was put together by Leah and Mike, Leah Remini and Mike Rinder. Um, they are talking about the case of James Barber. It's actually included in two of the documents that are in the OSA documents, as in the OSA files that Mike Rinder left Scientology with in his possession. Now, I want to get into this first because I'm going to start here because um, Leah and Mike talk about the documents, but they don't go into the details of the origins of them or how they came about or how Mike Rinder had them in his possession. So I wanted to first touch on that and then we can get uh, and then we can get going. Now, first of all, these documents are Mike Rinder's own documents, as in they were documents that he received or created. Um, they're either his writing or the writings that he received from other people who worked for the Church of Scientology at that time. And it spans across several years. Um, and one of the things that I want to point out, the one that we're going to touch on today, the documents are from 2006. So one of the things that Mike Rinder says is that he was in the hole from 2004 to 2007. And so he didn't know anything about anything. But what you will see, you'll begin to see that, in fact, he was still holding a position in this case, in this time period, it was the WDC OSA. And so he and he was still being he was still receiving communications. He was still being updated on things. He still had the ability and the power clearly through the documents, you can see that he had the ability to um, create orders, create directives, create programs, um, and stuff like that. So that's going to become more and more clear. So the origin of these documents, let's take a look at that. So this comes from Mike Rinder's book, A Billion Years, and it is in the prologue. It's the first page of the prologue, in fact, and it's the first paragraph of the prologue and it is also detailed later on in the book but this is i'm going to go with this one at, at the beginning it says as i rushed out the front door of Elrin hubbard's former office at 37 fitzroy street in london and stepped into a beautiful june day in 2007 the only thing i was certain of was that i had to get away before anyone realized what i was doing I left with only a briefcase containing my passport, a few papers, a thumb drive, and two cell phones, okay? So that thumb drive is what contained the documents. And the documents, as I said, consist of Mike Rinder's communications, his directives, his programs. Um, there's Hub plenty of Hubbard sort of references and quotes and stuff in there. Um, but these are the the writings that Mike Rinder was in possession of due to his position at that time, which was WDC OSA. Okay, so let's take a look at this first one. Okay, so I'm going to start around about the 25 minute mark and you can go and have a look at this video. It's called Leah and Mike are back. It's on Leah Remini's and Mike Rinder's YouTube channels. I'm starting this from about the 25 minute mark because 
the first 25 minutes is basically this preamble of this buildup of he's telling you how special and how amazing and how incredible it is that he has these documents and um and how monumental it is and um and he he takes 25 minutes uh thereabouts to basically present that and build that up so you know it's going to be good you know he's and the thing is here is the position that he's in is you've got Leah Remini who is championing championing for these Jane Doe's and the Danny Masterson trial this video was created by Mike Rinder and Leah Remini after Danny Masterson had been convicted of rape. And so the situation is that in the meantime, uh, the, these documents, these OSA documents had been leaked out. And now you had other people looking at them. And obviously the question is going to be asked of Mike Rinder, what was his knowledge of what had happened to these women, the victims of Danny Masterson uh, during the time that Mike Rinder was in charge of the Office of Special Affairs International. So, so yeah, so it's timely. This was in September 2023 that this video came out. It's a, a actually quite a while after he had escaped with the documents themselves, which was 2007. And listen, we know that it takes people a while to figure out like what they're doing after they leave a cult. I get it. It's going to take you time. 2010, he alleges that he provided these documents to the FBI, and I and I believe him. I absolutely do believe him. The trouble with is the documents is it's going to be pretty difficult for the FBI to interpret a lot of the things, and that's what I'm hoping to do. Whether the FBI could have done anything with them, I don't know. And why should he? Why should he sacrifice himself and and incriminate himself? Like he still has a life to live, and he still needs to survive beyond this cult that he was in. I understand that there's a lot of complexities in here, um, but I do think that the people who were affected by the actions and the and especially the names that are in these documents, I think that those people at the very least should be given these documents. I think that's important for victims to understand what happened to them. When you have in a lot of cases um, where you have things that were done to children and then you have an organization, the organization knew all the facts, the child didn't they were a victim of a crime. I think if you have those circumstances, I think it's really important for you to tell the person. Um, but in terms of self-incriminating, like, no, I don't think that he should do that either. I think that, you know, he has, he also has the right, he has that right to um, not try and put himself in jail. Like, I get it. My main issue with Mike Rinder is the fact that he is on these boards, the uh, the Aftermath Foundation, Child USA. He's in these positions of p prestige and power, and and that's where my issue lies. Is um, I, I have no problem with him being a whistleblower. I have no problem with him, you know, picking and choosing what information he comes out with, so long as he doesn't position himself next to victims and pretend to be protecting them because then that's a lie. If you're going to choose to withhold information so as not to incriminate yourself, that's fine. I really do feel like that's your right to do that. But when you are doing that and then also pretending to help victims, then you are lying. And not only are you lying, but then you're being awarded for those lies in fact, you are being presented and bolstered up and, you know, heralded as this war hero when in fact you are a war criminal. So what I'm trying to do is over the years, over these 15 years that Mike Rinder has been out in the public eye, and mind you, he's been doing a very good job of being a spokesperson for this anti-Scientology movement. I do wish that there was more focus on the harms that um, the children experienced. But, um, but, you know, again, like, how can Mike Rinder speak to that? He was the perpetrator. He he was not a victim of that. He wasn't a victim of the same crimes that I was or that my friends were, my childhood friends that I grew up with. So, um, so is that, you know, he can't speak to that. That's what we need to come forward and tell our stories. That's, you know, what we need to do. But when he is being you know, given these positions of prestige and he is getting an income from it and he has been heralded as a hero and he has been positioned with next to victims pretending to protect them. That's where I have the problem. I think that that 
that is not a safe environment. That's not safe for victims to believe that he, they will be protected by him or that they'll be helped by him. What I cannot stand is hypocrisy and I cannot stand the lies and I can't stand the whitewashing. And so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to, his crimes have been so thoroughly washed and I'm trying to unwash them because in order for anyone to see what really happened to the children and see what actually took place in this organization, we need to stop saying, oh, Scientology believes this. It's like, tell me what was done. Who was it done to? How was it done? When was it done? That's the only way that we can move forward. That's the only way we can have a strong argument. And as long as we're protecting and whitewashing Mike Rinder's crimes, then no one's going to hear the story of what actually happened. Because the full story of what happened to these children is not yet understood. So in order to understand what truly took place and what continues to take place today, we have to understand what Mike Rinder's role was. And we have to understand what Mike Rinder did. As much as we need to understand what Marty Rathbun did and as much as we need to understand what David Miscavige did, those three people were amongst the most effective in creating Scientology into what it is today. They were the ones, um, you know, amongst others, that brought about the tax-exempt status of the Church of Scientology. So we do have to understand what roles were there. And also, when we are talking about the cover-up of crimes, particularly against children um, or particularly of a sexual nature, then we need to understand whether or not there was a network that was involved in the cover-up of those crimes. And that's the thing that Mike Rinder can speak to. Um, now, again, he can choose not to do that, but then don't sit there next to a victim and lie to them or not tell them the information that they need to know because then you're doing further damage and it's not okay. And I'm not going to sit here and allow that to continue to happen. So that's why we have to talk about it. <laughs> okay, so without further ado, let's get this video rolling. This, these documents are documents that show what Scientology does to prevent information about sexual predators or sexual abusers or sexual, like I have to be careful, I can't say the R word and et cetera, et cetera, that keep that all internal. Okay, so quick comment here. Um, what I want to say about this is that we've heard a lot about we have these private investigators, we have this system, we know OSA uses private investigators to then um, go after critics of Scientology, and there's fair gaming, and we understand that that's really been quite public, there's so much documented about that, um, that there is this, you know, retribution against critics. But what we're seeing, what, he, what he's pointing to is that this what we're going to go into is one of the documents that isn't of that nature. And this is the point that I want to make is that when you have Mark Headley, and we're going to go into this later, but we've got his little chart, his little OSA chart, it's really cute up there. When Mark Headley talks about, so this is Mark Headley's taken the OSA documents and he's chosen to focus on the private investigators and the stalking and the harassment of Scientology critics or the people who left, like particularly the people that left the international base, the former executives. Um, and also Mark Headley is in those documents. And like, I understand why he would want to pull those ones in particular and go over those. But Mark Headley seems to think that OSA's exclusive role had to do with this function of going after critics. And what I'm saying is that that's not all that they did, Mark Headley, okay? What they also did was they went after anyone who was potentially bringing a civil suit or potentially bringing a criminal case against a Scientologist. And so anything that was a legal matter or a public relations matter, and that includes children who were sexually abused and women who were raped or anyone who was raped or sexually abused, um, any legal matter, and any public relations issue. Okay, Mark Headley, just so that we understand. Okay, um, and so let's let's continue with that. This is these documents demonstrate more that 
Scientology covers stuff up big time mm -hmm. in order to prevent PR flaps. And by definition, anybody who gets in, in trouble with the law or who violates the law is a PR flap. Okay. So this these documents concern this this Scientology celebrity James Bal um, James Barbour mm -hmm. B A R B O U R. Okay, so there's two documents regarding James Barber that are in the OSA documents, as in they're in the thumb drive that Mike Rinder left Scientology with. Okay, so the function of OSA, the Office of Special Affairs, is to manage all legal matters and also to manage the public relations, the media, etc. And so they are the ones that will get included in any reports of this nature, especially high profile, but anything that is going to cause a legal issue. Um, and as soon as you report a crime or a crime gets reported to police, that becomes a legal matter. In this particular case, the victim is actually not a member of Scientology. Um, the perpetrator is, however, a, a Scientology celebrity. And so they are they actually need to help manage his legal risk. It's like by extension, it's this crazy thing that happens. Um, and so yeah, we'll continue with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. In 2006, James Barber was arrested for sodomy and oral sex with a 15 year old. Now, here is what Scientology did about this. And I'm going to start running through some of these documents and, and, and explain some of this to you yeah. so you understand the, the significance of it. And the first document is literally the cover page of the first report about this. And this is, Mike, I want to just ask you, because you were the head of OSA, so you're aware of these types of activities. Yeah. This is just normal operating procedure for Scientology. When you find out that there's a situation, right? They call it a sit or. A okay. I just want to point out, she says you were the head of OSA. So you were aware of these types of issues, right? So she, it, it gives you this impression that Mike Rinder didn't know about this one, but he knew how things would happen if he knew scenarios or he knew these types of issues, how they would be or might be handled as former head of OSA. Um, I just think that, mm, yeah, we'll, we'll keep going. Potential sit. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. This is, this is like textbook. And this is the idea behind this, Mike, is listen, listen, we're, we're Sea Org members. The greatest good is to protect Scientology. And we will fix James Barber with more Scientology. We will audit out with Scientology technology his penchant for um, the activity. Being a sexual did. predator. Correct. Right. All right. So the thing that I want to touch on there is. Okay, so what you have here is you have two things going on because you have the Scientology belief system that Leah Remini is describing, which is true, but then you have the structure or the network that enforces the policies, right? So you have, in other words, I'm saying you have the policies and then you have the structure that enforces it. And Mike Rinder was the head of the structure, which is called the Office of Special Affairs International. He was the head of that structure that enforced those policies. Right, which would be the same for any uh, Scientology predator, right? Is that's the yes. thought? It's not th the purpose of this is not to protect a child predator. Yeah. The purpose of this is to protect Scientology. Correct. And let's also not forget, Leah, what Hubbard wrote about getting into the hands of the court system or law enforcement. Right. That this is all psych influenced, and you know, and that's you're basically enemy number one. Right. Yeah, you're basically yeah. Uh, giving a death sentence to whoever it is that ends up in the in the clutches of mm -hmm. the of law enforcement and the judiciary. Mm -hmm. And so 
you know, you put those two things together and you have a pretty powerful motivation and justification for why this is really the best thing to do. Like, right. Okay. So, so here, Mike Rinder and Leah Remini, they've descri described a crime. So if you cover up a felony, for example, then that's a felony. So covering up a crime is a crime, right? They're, what they're describing is then the motivation there is, you know, based on this belief system in that you believe that you're doing, you're actually doing the person good. You're doing the victim good rather than harm them. You're, you're kind of protecting them from harm in, in a way you're saving them from the psychs, right? Now, my question is, is the person who committed the crime, are they then now exempt from, or do they get automatic immunity because they said, well, I did that because I believed such and such. Like, that's my question for the public. And is someone exempt of a crime because they believed they were doing the right thing when they committed the crime? Like, that's my question. Because, and that's the predicament that Mike Rinder is in. Mike Rinder and his network covered up crimes, okay? They're not the other ones. Tons of people in Scientology did. Tons of people. Um, but for each of those people, are they not liable? Are they not, should they not be held accountable like, where is the accountability? If you can just say, well, I believed that. So then, so then, you know, if we, you know, contrast that with something else, if I go out and I go and shoot somebody in the head and then I say, well, I believe that I was doing that person a favor. Does, am I exempt from committing that crime? So that is really what we're talking about. We're talking about a belief system, which is used as a justification and a motivation for committing a crime. Does that mean that the crime is null and void because you believed you were doing good? I would Keep this guy out of the public eye. Don't let anybody find out about it because it's going to be a PR flat, but also it's going to be better for him. Right. And this, this, um, mindset is mm -hmm. very, very ingrained in OSA. I mean, that was totally my mindset. Right. That was completely 100%. That was how I viewed things. What's good for Scientology is what's important. What's good for society, right. society's all messed up anyway, and we have right. to deal with that. So we got to get, we got to keep Scientology going and moving forward because only then we'll be able to save the world and every man, woman, and child in it, et cetera, et cetera. 